a handout um, on Blackboard under the folder Con Files. I think I called it Con Handout. Maybe. Um, for Friday, you should download it from the office. Two sides, very small print. Uh, and you should read over these. These are the quotes, uh, all except the last one, I think, is from uh, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. So we'll be talking about the sort of Kantian background uh, on, on Friday, and I'll be referring to some of these quotes. You should um, read it and have it with your um, For Monday, then, you should read the preface to the book. So in this edition, that's pages three through eight. And we'll be going slowly through that, um, just to make sure we're clear about the vocabulary. About what comes about. So that's for Monday, and then we'll move on to part one. Um, if you want to get ahead. So today I want to talk about an alternative to Hobbes, an alternative moral theory to Hobbes, that is not Kant's theory either, but is very important that we understand this alternative in order to be clear about what Kant is saying. So suppose, here I'm building up to this alternative, an alternative to Hobbes. So suppose we start with Hobbes's account of subjective values. So suppose we go along with Hobbes's account of the modern scientific picture of the world, the modern metaphysical picture of the world, in which there's nothing which is good in itself. No states of affairs or ends are intrinsically good. But ends or goals or states of affairs are made good by someone desiring. So this is how, as it were, value gets introduced into the world for Hobbes. When someone desires something, they take that end, the thing that's desired, to be good for them, from their point. Okay, so suppose we stick with that picture, and this means that immediately there are going to be lots of different goods for different people, because different people desire different things, and so they will take different ends to be good. Okay, these can conflict, and this is ultimately why for Hobbes the state of nature is a state of war all of that Ultimately, because there's no way to resolve conflicts among subjective groups. Okay? But now, suppose instead of suppose instead of going along with Hobbes's attempt to solve this, Hobbes's attempt to solve this conflict among subjective goods is to seed over our judgment to a song, to rely on someone else's subjective judgment for our own, substituted for our own, and treat it as if it were objective. That's going to, for Hobbes, that's the only way to uh, resolve this, these conf conflicts among subjective values. But suppose we take a different strategy. Suppose we try something else. Suppose we say, well, in this situation, I have my desires and my conception of the good, my subjective ends that I take to be good. And you have yours. They're different. They conflict. We are in conflict with one another, instead of relying on someone else's judgment, maybe we can resolve this ourselves. Maybe what we can do is ourselves try to become more impartial. So what we should do is, 
food for thought. Try to look at our desires, our judgments about what's good, about what's valuable, from an impartial point of view. Recognize that not only do I have desires and therefore subjective values, but you do too. And maybe we could try to resolve these conflicts by viewing these different subjective desires impartially. And we might say the moral point of view is <coughs> impartial. The moral point of view isn't simply a matter of what I happen to desire, or what you happen to desire, or what any individual happens to desire. Maybe the moral point of view is impartial amongst all of those desires. So the moral point of view somehow treats all of those different subjective goods impartial. Uh, we might say that instead of saying that the satisfaction of my desires, the satisfaction of my subjective good, uh, my, my sub subjective desires is good, what we, should, what we should say from this moral point of view, what we should say from this impartial point of view, is that the satisfaction of anyone's desires is good. Um, so, from an impartial point of view, from a moral point of view, everyone's desires, we might say, are equally important, equally valuable. So we shouldn't make, so from this moral point of view, we shouldn't make a distinction between my desires and the good ends that I take to be good, and your desires, the uh, and that your desires take to be good. Anybody's desires make those ends good. So what we have to do is sort of ratchet ourselves out of our own narrow point of view, adopt an impartial point of view where we can see that everybody's desires make certain, make the ends that they're directed toward good. So this is uh, an important step here, right? So I have to, what's, what, on this view, what morality requires of me now is that I not be tied to my own particular desires but treat everyone's, including my own, but everyone else's, impartially and recognize them to make states of affairs good. Okay, questions about that so far? So this is not Hobbes. This is not Hobbes. This is an attempt to find a resolution to conflicting <coughs> subjective goods by adopting an impartial moral point of view. Okay, of course desires may conflict. And so we need to decide what to do from this impartial point of view when there's a conflict among desires. Uh, and the answer, we might say, is to notice that these different desires may become in different strengths. So in order to decide what to do, we should compare the strength of the conflicting desires. Um, and of course, uh, one state of affairs might satisfy the desires of more people than some other states of affairs. So we need to take into account how many people have their desires satisfied and how strong those desires are. And then we can figure out maybe the extent to which some state of affairs would satisfy how many people's desires and how intense they are compared to some other states of affairs. And what we should do is add up the strength of the desires of all the people who would have desire satisfied in some state of affairs and compare that to some alternative, maybe those who would have their desires frustrated by that state of affairs and how intense that would be. Um, 
So we're going to resolve conflict based on which desires have the greatest intensity. And when we figure out how many people have those desires and how intense they are, what we should do is act in a way that will lead to the greatest overall satisfaction of desires impartially considered. All right, so on this picture, we start with a subjective account of value, like Hobbes had. But now instead of seeding our judgment about uh, value over to some third party, we're going to try to resolve conflicts ourselves by adopting an impartial point of view. From this impartial point of view, we act, sorry, uh, from this impartial point of view, what is good maybe what is objectively good now is to do whatever is going to maximally satisfy the subjective desires that everybody has. And, there, and I'll say one more time, there are going to be trade-offs. We have to compare states of affairs based on the total level of satisfaction of desires in that state of affairs compared to some other. And there are going to be two dimensions here. How many people have their desires satisfied and how intense those desires are. Okay? And so from this impartial moral point of view, what is now objectively good is the maximum satisfaction of subjective desires. Is that clear? Okay, and this of course is utilitarianism. So utilitarianism is the name for this moral theory, which I just described to you. Where we take everybody's own individual subjective desires, consider them from an impartial point of view, where everybody's desires may be figure in, not only your own. And what's required is, what's morally required, what's objectively good, is the maximum satisfaction, not just of your own, but of the total, the totality, the aggregate of desires that you have. Okay? Okay, so I want to, questions about that? Okay, so I want to make two points about the structure of utilitarianism. So utilitarianism, um, right. so two points about the structure of utilitarianism. The first is this. The, um, the move from each of us having our own subjective desires and our own subjective good to requiring us to act on an impartial perspective is a big deal, and you should not slight over this. Um, it's a big change. Um, it's at least a partial abandonment of the underlying subjectivism that we started with. Because the underlying subjectivism that we started with was motivated by uh, what, what's often thought of as a modern, scientific, metaphysical view of the world, where there's no objective value built into the world. We just have our own inclinations and desires. We have our own, therefore, subjective account of what's good. And this is telling us that, that our subjective good is not, in fact, objective, not necessarily.